Open your Bibles to Genesis chapter 1. Before I go there, see I'm still in the introductions, introductory stage of all this present teaching the last day series concerning the end from the beginning. I haven't passed that point yet. But I, there's, I think there's something that we probably should look at in the future. I'm not going to get into it today. Now there's three different areas within the tabernacle that's very interesting. If you know anything about the tabernacle that God instructed the children of Israel to build when they were wandering in the desert before they got a temple, there are three areas represented in that tabernacle that sticks out, to me at least, I don't believe it's coincidence. When you do the research and the findings that you could pull from that research, that also points to a timeline. In the tabernacle, you have the outer court, you have the holy place, and you have the holy of holies. Now the What's interesting about this, and I'm not going to get into details tonight, you have the outer court. The tabernacle looked more like a rectangle than a square. And you had certain sections inside this rectangle, the outer court, the holy place, and the holy of holies. The outer court consists of 1,500 cubits. The holy place consisted of 2,000 cubits. The holy of holies was 1,000 cubits. <clears throat> so you have the outer court, 1,500, the holy place, 2,000, and the holy of holies, 1,000 cubits. You can say the outer court represented the Mosaic law. You can say the holy place represented the church age, the age of grace, the 2,000 years of it. The Mosaic law came into existence about 1,500 years prior to Jesus' arrival. And then you have the Masonic kingdom, which has not yet come, which would be 1,000 years. So you See the similarities here? The outer court, 1,500. The holy place, 2,000. The holy of holies, 1,000. The areas, the, the area, excuse me, or the fenced-in surrounding area that's around the outer court, which circles around, well, not really circles, but you know what I'm trying to say. From point A to point B to point C, point D, back. It was 1,500 cubits squared. Just as the period of time, approximately, that the Mosaic law was enforced before Christ's first coming. That could be a coincidence. Another thing about the outer court, everything in the outer court was constructed in bronze, and bronze symbolizes judgment. And that's exactly what the law did. Judgment. It pronounced you guilty, and that judgment 
and a blood sacrifice was required. What about the holy place in the tabernacle? A different section inside the tabernacle. As I said just a few months ago, could that represent the church age? It's an area or a room, let's just put it that way, 20 by 10 by 10 cubits. Thus, representing the 2,000 years of the church age. See, only the priests could come or go into this area and they had to cleanse themselves before they even went to the area. But in this particular area, nothing was made up of bronze. Nothing was made up of that judgment which pronounced you guilty. What was in that particular area in the holy place? One, the table of showbread, which is, represents Christ, the bread of life. Two, the lampstand, Christ, the light of the world. And of course, you had then the altar of incense, which represents Christ, our intercessor. The items in that holy place was made of gold, silver, and wood, representing the deity and redemption and also the humanity of Jesus Christ. It paints a picture as Jesus as the truth regarding salvation. Now, I'm really summarizing all this, but is that a coincidence? Now we have two coincidences in a row. The first 1500 could it represent the amount of years prior to Jesus' first coming? The years in judgment? The years that the Mosaic Law pronounced us guilty? And then you have Jesus in the Holy of Holies representing the 2,000 cubits. Or well, could that be 2,000 years also? The age of grace. The salvation that Jesus provided. And then you go into the Holy of Holies in the tabernacle. The Holy of Holies is where the Ark of the Covenant was placed. And only the high priest could go inside the Holy of Holies. No one else. And he went inside the Holy of Holies one day a year. One day a year. In the presence of God. Could this area represent also the coming of the kingdom age? Besides what you hear, it has not arrived yet. Where God shall dwell among his people in the visible form. This very special area inside the tabernacle area contained the real presence of God. When Jesus comes back in his millennial kingdom, he's going to be God with us. He's going to be present. We're all priests. Not just one person is going to be able to only go to Jesus once a year. That's not how it's going to work in the millennial kingdom. And that represents a thousand cubits. Now, you can say that's all coincidence. I don't think so. I don't think the 1500 and the 2000, then the thousand measurement is a coincidence. And I've been the last 
several service programs, putting one coincidence down after another. There comes a point when you've got to finally say, there's just too many coincidences throughout the scripture that line up certain dates, certain timelines, certain periods of time that is undeniable. Let's do some more comparisons. About 15 minutes I'll have left. Let's compare a timeline of the seven days of creation and the 7,000 year age. I have said that the creation account that we find here in Genesis gives us a prophetic overview of everything that would happen on this planet. Not every detail, but I believe general big things that have happened on this planet. And once again, you probably could dismiss this as coincidence, but I don't think so. I'll let you judge for yourself. I'm convinced. I'll let you judge, judge it for yourself. Let's read Genesis 1, starting with the first verse to the fifth verse. In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form, and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. What was the big event there in that first day? Light and darkness. In that first thousand years, what was the big event? Adam's sin. I mean, there was a lot of events, but none bigger than that. And Adam's sin brought what? To all of us, ever since his sin, darkness. Darkness, folks. So the big event in this creation timeline, when you do a comparison of timelines of the seven days of creation, the 7,000 year age, you pick certain events in each age. Sin. Adam's sin was the big event. And what did sin bring upon all of us, including Adam? Darkness. Darkness. So the first day in God's creation, He said, let there be light, and, and there was light. And God called the light day, and the darkness He called night. Good coincidence? Maybe. Let's continue. Let's go to verse 6 through 8. And God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. And God called the firmament heaven, and the, ev and the evening and the morning were the second day. So in the second day of the creation timeline is separation of waters. We just read that, right? In the second thousand years, what was the big event? The flood happened. And what did the flood produce? The, the separating Noah from all other people. Now that's generalizing it, but that's what happened. There was a separation. 
The separation of waters was the big ticket item in God's second day. In the second thousand years, the flood happened, which caused a separation of Noah from all other people on this earth based on waters. Maybe that's two coincidences in a row. Let's move on to the third day. Start with verse 9. And God said, Let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place, and let the dry land appear, and it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters called he seas. And God saw that it was good. And God said, Let the earth bring forth grass. The herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed it is itself upon the earth. And it was so. And the earth brought forth grass, and herb yielding seed after his kind. And the tree yielding fruit, who see what was in itself after his kind. And God saw that it was good. And the evening and the morning were the third day. So what did God do in the third day? On this earth. He brought forth trees. Through seed. He brought through grass through seed. What was the big ticket item in the third 1,000 year age of this planet? Think hard with me here now. Abraham is promised to be the father of nations through his seed. Bringing forth the nation of Israel. Which, by the way, another coincidence, the nation of Israel is referred to as a tree in Scripture. Well, that's weird. And it's a coincidence. Is it? You could read right through this chapter and not make the connections if you don't have a good, grounded understanding of the scriptures and what happened in each period of time in God's timelines. Let's move on the fourth day. This one really is a huge coincidence. Let's start at verse 14. And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night, and let the, them be for the signs and for the seasons and for the days and years. For seasons should be their appointed time or fixed times. And let them be, there for, let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. And God said, set them in the firmament of heaven to give light upon the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And the evening and morning were the fourth day. So God's big ticket item in that fourth day is lights in the firmament, which I believe has a gospel message in it. But that's another teaching. God's big ticket item was lights in the firmament. What was the biggest ticket item in the fourth 1,000 year? Now this should just come up like that in your mind. Jesus brings light to the world. That is the big ticket item in that fourth 1,000 year. Is it a coincidence that God created these lights in the fourth day? Am I starting to get your attention? I'm running out of time, so let's go quickly through these. Fifth day, starting with verse 20. And God said, The waters 
Bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life, and the fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. And God created great whales and every living creature that moveth, which, which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind, and every winged fowl after his kind. And God saw that it was good, and God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters and the seas, and let fowl multiply in the earth. And the evening and the morning were the fifth day. So God, big ticket item, in that fifth day was multiplying of all types of creatures. In the fifth 1,000 year, what happened? This is part of history, whether you know it or not. If you don't, you can research it out for yourself. Population explosions. Population soar. Many nations, and unfortunately many religions, come into existence. And unfortunately, Roman Catholicism and Islam. Not Christianity that dominates this world. Those two have the majority. You don't believe me? Do the research. The multiplying creatures. God's ticket item on day five. In the fifth 1,000 years. The multiplying creatures of populations and of false religions. The multiplic multiplication factor in that fifth 1,000 year. Now there's a lot of things I could tie into that too, but this is a general outline right now. The sixth day, verse 24, And God said, Let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind, cattle, creeping thing, and beasts of the earth after his kind, it was so. And God made the beasts of the earth after his kind, and cattle after their kind, and everything that creepeth upon the earth after his kind. And God saw that it was good. And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, or appearances. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image, and the image of God created him in his Male and female created he them. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply, and plunish the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and every, over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed, which is upon the face of the earth, and every tree in which is, is the fruit of the tree yielding seed. To you it shall be for meat. And to every beast of the earth, and to every fowl of the air, and to everything that creepeth upon the earth, wherein this there is life. I have given every green herb for meat, and it was so. And God saw everything that he made, and behold, it was very good in the evening and the morning were the sixth day. I read that through that fast. You can read it through it slower in your own time. But what was God big ticket item on that sixth day? It's obvious. God created man in his own appearance or image. Now, there's many things that I could point to and be more specific about. But in that six 1,000 year time period that we live in now, it seemed that God is creating a people for himself. And then we get in the seventh day. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 1, that Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the hosts of them. And on the seventh day God ended his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day, from all his work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day, and sanctified it, because that in it had rested from all his work which God created and made. So, God's creation days, the seventh day, He ended His work. What happens in our seventh 1,000 year? Which is still yet to happen. Soon, but still yet to happen. Jesus will return. He will rule and reign on earth as it is written in the Bible. That is, 
it is written in the scriptures where we will enter in to his rest which means our rest also that's a coincidence all these could be coincidences but things just keep adding up folks when is enough coincidence going to be enough there's a story behind all of this and I will get into the details of a lot of these things I'm just still trying to get your attention because you're not taught these things just like you weren't taught in most of the things in the last day series but they're important to know if you want to know the end from the beginning people have been emailing me and writing me with all kinds of their own timelines they have put together every single one that's come to cross my desk are missing important elements in it that throws the whole timeline off not by a little by a lot and I'll get to that way down the road but I'll get there sooner or later now if you're interested in me to continue on this stuff that we could find in the scriptures important things that we can find in the scriptures let me know I don't think any of these are a coincidence and I gave you general summaries some st stick out more than others but they're none of them are a coincidence and hopefully you start to understand that if you do I want to hear from you play the song <laughs>